So we're starting to see now six gigabytes in tablets. And this is the first one that I'm going to review with the Apollo Lake M3450. So it has two three gigabyte chips from Samsung, their low power double data rate three chips, 64 gigabytes of storage, unfortunately just wireless in. I would have liked to have seen wireless AC on this. You can see the design of it. It's very similar to the X5 Pro that I reviewed. Kickstand, that is the last position you get. And then the first position and an optional keyboard type cover and also an optional stylus. This just docks in like any other two in one. And you can of course fold that up into a nice little neat package. Closing the keyboard will put the screen into sleep mode as well. So let's have a look at this one here in greater detail. The rear of the tablet's made out of metal. So this along here, the whole backing of it and the kickstand. You get a little bit of plastic along the top here for the wireless and Bluetooth antenna reception. The buttons on the top and side, those are plastic. The micro SD card slot is located under the kickstand and this whole back plate you can see is screwed in place. So it's very solid. And the hinge here is made out of metal too. So I don't think there's any chance of this breaking anytime soon. It's not like it's made out of plastic. There are no plastic components in that whatsoever. So port location on the X3 Plus isn't really the greatest. I don't know why Techglass decided to, just like the X5 Pro, put all the ports up the top of the tablet instead of down the bottom. So we have here DC in for charging, micro HDMI that outputs a maximum of 4K 30Hz, and below that a USB 3 port. Now this USB 3 port will power external hard drives without any problems. And on the left you'll find the 3.5mm headphone jack. It supports microphones below that, a micro USB 2 port that can work as data as long as you've got yourself an OTA adapter. So that's micro USB to full size USB adapter. You can plug some things into there, which is an added bonus to have two ports on the tablet, even if we have to use an adapter. Below that is the plastic volume up and down button, which doesn't wiggle around or anything. It has a good feel to it. Now the cameras we have on here, 5 megapixel autofocus camera on the rear and a front 2 megapixel camera. And onto the optional type cover keyboard. So I measured it to be 1.47 millimeters of travel that the keys have. And it's spaced out nice enough. There's enough there I feel for a good typing experience and the response of the keys is good. However, if you have a look at the touchpad, it is really pathetic because it's so short very annoying. Luckily, there's this button shortcut right here that I absolutely love because it disables it completely and then I use a mouse. It's a little sad, but this type cover is just so disappointing. It does have incorporated mouse buttons and yes, it does support gestures, but I personally won't be using it at all. And the keyboard, as shown in the start, can be propped up to a higher level, which makes it a little more comfortable to type on. So it has a non-laminated screen, so that means there's a gap between the glass digitizer and then the IPS panel below. The panel's a 1080p one, so 1920 by 1080 resolution, and I found that it to be very responsive, very accurate to touch, a really good experience, the touch on this. Now it does come with a pre-applied screen protector, and the maximum brightness I've measured to be 250 lumens of brightness. Now in order to get the 250, you need to make sure that you disable this right here, which is the Intel power saving technology. If that is enabled, the maximum output you'll get is only around 211 lux, which makes the panel look a little dull and not quite bright enough. 250 is borderline what I would call good enough sufficient brightness, but for indoors it's perfectly fine. Now this screen will suffer greatly. If you try to use it outdoors, you're gonna have a lot of problems with it because it's non-laminated, it's got a screen protector on it, and the brightness I feel for outdoor use needs to be very high, like 400 lux. But overall, a good panel. I do like the colors on it. I do like the blacks and the contrast as well. Now for loudspeakers, we have two either side. There's one on the left just down here on the bottom, the other one's in the same position. And they sound quite decent actually, maximum volumes around 87, 88 decibels. So let's have a listen to them. But before I play this sample video here, I do believe the location of them down the bottom should have been up here at the top. So they could have moved all the ports down to the bottom. Anyway, that's just personal 
preference here, and of course they could have slimmed down the bezels a little bit too. Anyway, chipset wise, not really much of an improvement, I don't think, but I will check that out, I'll run and two to, but some things have been improved. The initial design is good, but what they've added is a so you can hear the volume output of this is quite good. It's better than other tablets. Most tablets don't really come across as loud as this one. So at least they have improved some aspects of their tablets recently. But at 100% volume, you do notice now and then a little bit of distortion coming from the speakers. The 3.5 millimeter headphone jack is good. Surprisingly clear sound, reasonably loud, no static or interference on my model here. So there is an optional stylus you can buy for it, but don't. I'll explain why. Because this stylus is very basic. It's, yes, an active stylus that's powered. USB port on the back there, so you need to charge it. It has an internal battery. But why I say don't get it is, is completely useless because it does not support pressure sensitivity. So all it really is is just an accurate pointer. I'm not even going to demonstrate it. It does have palm rejection only when it touches the screen, so making writing super difficult with it. So really, I would skip on the stylus. Now moving over to the device manager here, you can see that the wireless card is wireless N. This is disappointing. I really wanted to see wireless AC on this, as mentioned in the start, that they should have it, because all the other competition as well is shipping with wireless AC now, and not the sole wireless N. So the disk drive on board we have is a SanDisk DF4064 that of course 64 stands for 64 gigabytes of storage but you get about 42 gigabytes free on first boot when using Windows. There's nothing really else here of interest to show you. Now the RAM is running at 1600 megahertz which is the full supported speed and that is dual channel 2 so no problems with the RAM and they have dedicated, of course, 167 megabytes to the GPU just to help aid in performance there. Tends to make things a little more smoother, which it really is at the moment, only running 1080p screen. It seems a lot smoother than other devices with those higher resolution screens. So Windows fully activated, no problems with the activation there. I've got a couple of demo clips here I wanted to play. So anything that's 2K, 1080p that is all fine I do have here a 4k file now 4k streaming and YouTube and edge works perfectly fine no problems with that let's see if it can handle first a 10-bit HEVC file 60 megabits let's have a look and see how smooth this is that is fine perfectly fine no problems with that and now over double the rate 4k 10-bit this is where systems start to struggle a little bit But you'll see that it's handling that a lot better than other devices. It seems that that extra little bit of RAM is definitely helping there. That is quite smooth. Now, if I skip ahead on the seek ahead here, you see that that works quite quickly. So overall, I am impressed with that performance and just getting around the system in general, in and out of Windows, opening and closing things. We don't see that huge stutter and lag then when we go to open up the Windows start menu there but there is still a little bit of lag there on the Apollo Lakes. So I have a couple of benchmarks I wanted to show you. Now the first one is the storage speeds. Now there are some good things and some bad things here. So the good thing is EMMC 5 spec by the looks of it with that sand disk and those write speeds and read speeds are very good. 4Ks aren't bad. Now the bad things here are the SD card slot is only running in USB 2 speed so I can't get the full performance out of my card. Not really good to see them doing that. And here we have uh, the USB 3 port running at full USB 3 speeds. And 2.2 benchmark here. Um, that's, that's not loading in the right. Okay, I don't know what's going on with that. The rotation's wrong. But you can see there anyway, whoop. <laughs> oh, okay, you can see 118,000 points there, which is a good score, not bad at all. Now if I switch over now into Edge, this is the wireless end speeds, 
Now on this connection that I have, I should and can on wireless AC get easily over 250 megabits per second. So that's the kind of speed we're missing out on if we had wireless AC, well, unfortunately we don't. So wireless N has its limits. And this right here now is the Geekbench 4 score. If it loads up, there we go. Very good score here. One of the fastest, if not, in fact, the fastest I have seen on the Celeron N3450. So that is great there. Of course, battery life is very important in a tablet, and it's a little disappointing here. Here in this test, I ran the tablet from 100% down to, well, 8.7, as you can see, and I managed to get 5 hours, 47 minutes. This was with the brightness set to 25%, which was bright enough to be fine for indoor use, and I was in edge most of the time, YouTube streaming, multitasking, I did use Chrome approximately half an hour or so. So I think battery life, it should be just a bit more. I'd love to see around seven hours out of any tablet to try and make it through a full day's use. Now, one thing to note though, I did not have the display settings, the power saving settings enabled. Um, I currently have them disabled so I can get the maximum screen brightness. Now that will have an impact, I do believe, on possibly squeezing out maybe an extra 30 minutes or so. So if you have the display saving technology enabled now, that will dim the screen down and yeah, give you a bit of a bonus, just use a little bit less energy there. So the first game I shall test out is League of Legends, very popular online title. You've probably seen my videos before, I always test this game. So it will be the same conditions, a bot, match, summoners, rift. Sorry I can't do a live game because I just simply don't have enough time for that and I don't want to annoy people just leaving the game halfway through. Frame rate is looking good. It's hovering around 45 frames per second. I mean there's not too much action going on on screen but you can move around the map very smooth. This one I don't think is going to have any problems playing this game. Now if you do encounter a little bit of lag, for example the frame is frame rate is dipping down below 30 frames per second, then just drop the resolution down to 720p, I think will fix that. You can see now it's actually dropping a little bit to about 41 now. But looking good. Okay, so I look now at Counter-Strike. This is 800 times 600 resolution. And you can see that performance is not as good as the Chewy HI-13, which was running at 1024x768 getting a lot faster frame rates than this so at times it's over 30 and at other times you can see it's dipping right down to about 19 there so not really ideal i had expected better performance i don't know what chewy did on the hi13 but they definitely optimized that gpu to perform so much better when it comes to gaming Now the last game I'm going to test out, this is Asphalt Extreme 1080p, the native screen resolution on the optimal setting, which is the default setting, I think. You can see that it's not running at 30 frames per second. This is a little laggy, a little bit of stutter here and there, but it is playable at least. But I do think if you want better performance, you're going to have to lower that desktop resolution down to 720p. Or perhaps set the setting on the highest performance. After all of that gaming, let's have a look at the thermals, which are really good. I have actually never seen this go over, I think it's about 60 degrees. It is really good. You can see there the cores, they haven't gone over 60 degrees maximum temperatures. Normally you don't ever see it this low. So I think Techlast have put some copper in there, some thermal pads. They've done an excellent job with the thermals on this. And the GPU, okay, GPU did get up to 63. So that's as hot as it's going to get. So no problem. Touching the rear of it, it just feels hardly even warm to the touch. So they have done a very good job here. So to quickly summarize here, the build quality is decent. It's very solid, well put together. We've got a 1080p screen, 6 gigabytes of RAM, and because of that lower resolution screen compared to the high res ones, performance feels a lot quicker, a lot more snappier. The touchscreen also is very responsive. It seems accurate and fast, and 
performance, as you're seeing with some of those benchmarks, are some of the highest I have seen yet. So overall, it performs well, it's good. Now some areas that are a little gray for me that I don't particularly like is the fact that we've got wireless N only, whereas the competition now are using wireless AC, which is a lot faster, because this maxes out around 40 megabits per second, where in other laptops and tablets, with wireless AC, I'm able to get 250, so a huge difference there. The other thing is the touchpad annoys me. It's just way too short. I do understand using 16 by nine ratio. They have had limited size to work with, so I stick to using a mouse. But if you're not a mouse user, you want a good touchpad, stay clear of this one because it's just frustrating. It's gonna really annoy you, like it annoyed me. Now the other thing is a slight con, is the battery life isn't exactly the greatest five to six hours there. Ideally, I like to see seven at least on a tablet so you can try and make it through a whole day and it barely does it at around 25% getting only six hours there that I managed to squeeze out almost. So thank you so much for watching this review. Hopefully it's made your decision a little easier when you're looking at these kind of devices, the cheap alternatives from China. And I do hope to see you back in the channel soon. Bye for now.